we had lodgepole pine at less than 8% fuel moisture. Gives you a precursor of kind of what to expect as it came forward. And then the summer kind of started. It was beyond anything that anybody knew how to model, knew how to calculate. It was a basically the opening of a new generation of how we were going to look at fire management. Superintendent Barbie, he had the right idea. Um, he had the education, he had the experience around fire, he felt comfortable with it, and he knew it and he belonged in that ecosystem. And that was the fundamental principle that everybody operated on. It belonged there. And the challenge was the American public and the administration wasn't comfortable for the fallout and the size that it was going to create. And when you put smoke in Kansas City from Yellowstone, it gets attention. The woods are so dry that it's drier than kill dried lumber. Now, when I went out there, I was, I had exactly the same reaction you did. You mean we're, we're gonna burn up Yellowstone National Park because it's our policy not to fight fires. Barbie was under terrible pressure. I think he did well. Mm -hmm. uh, you will hear within some of the community mm -hmm. that, oh, they didn't have a good plan and they didn't do this and they, but they did it. And that take guts. And he stood up and did it. I admire him for it. The most powerful force on our landscape is fire. It releases more energy and cycles more material than anything we do. So you've got to be willing to do it. Now I'll tell anybody today, if on the night before you have to make a decision on a prescribed fire, I want you to wake up in the middle of the night and I want you to ask yourself a question. Am I gonna make that decision for the good of the landscape or for the good of my career? Don't tell me what you're gonna say, tell yourself. Ask yourself the question, am I going to make the decision for the good of this landscape that I'm managing or for the safety of my career? And then I want you to ask yourself another question. If you said you're going to do it for your career, let me ask you one more question. Should you have your job? Well, fire is a part of all of these ecosystems, you know. The Yellowstone fires of 1988 were something that really brought fire into the living rooms of most Americans. But it wasn't an ecological disaster of any sort. The Yellowstone uh, ecosystem has burned many times. The species there are easily capable of, um, of enduring these kinds of fires. When fires occur um, and kills the, the parent tree, uh, the seeds are released into fresh mineral soil and you end up with uh, opportunity for regeneration. What we had there prior to 88 won't be there afterwards. So it's gone, it's destroyed. But that doesn't tell it in terms of an ecological perspective. Yes, the trees as we know them have changed. Literally before the end of the fire season, in fact, midway through the fire season, you could go to the early barns and they were already sprouting green and regrowing. And so that changed people's perspective. It's, it's not gone, it's not devastated, it will come back.
None of it would be there without a fully functioning ecosystem, and fire is part of that. If you realize that, why would you want to get rid of fire? If we're going to manage those for sustainability, then we need to have those kinds of fire influences there. Without it, those species wouldn't survive. Probably one of the most significant things that the Forest Service has ever done in, in the effects of managing a landscape is to create the 10 a.m. policy. The 10 a.m. policy said, all fires are bad. They will be put out by 10 o'clock the next morning because that's the start of your burning period. That's when the fires start to run. So what did that do? That's the fires in 1940. There's the only fire that got away from them. That's 1940. Look at 30. Look at 20. Well, what do you know? There's 50. A little fire right there. There's the 60s. They got, one of them got away from them. There's a few little ones. 1970s, no fires except that little bitty one. We're putting them all out is graphic. 1980s, same thing. How many years of fire suppression do we have? How much has the trees grown in that period of time? 1940 to, that's 40 years, 50 years at the end of 80s. Still didn't do much. Now you're showing, you're beginning to see, this is in the Selway Bitterroot. You're seeing the effects of our fire program that started in 1973, 72. And so they're getting a little fire. They're changing their attitudes. By 2000, we've changed our attitude enough that we're using resource fires in various places, which we did not do before because the 10 a.m. policy is gone. Now you're doing fire management. Big difference, big change. kept working on this plan and we we ended up taking it to Washington DC. Bob Much and I did. And this is the briefing book that we took to the chief. It's called Ecological Interpretations of the White Capped Drainage, a basis for wilderness fire management. The chief at the time was John McGuire. And the director of research and I think his name was Buckman but he was in the room and we showed it. And by the way, I would share with you that by this time I was well aware of what the Park Service was doing. And they were starting their fires in, in the Sequoia country, Kings Canyon and so forth. And I knew some of those people and, and I knew that they were applying fire to the landscape. They'd been doing so for about two or three years. So one of the ways we convinced the chief's office is that we needed to catch up with the Park Service because we didn't want them to be ahead of us. So we were trying to market this and sell it. And Buckman said, I think we should do this because we want to protect those old yellow-bellied ponderosa pine and the only way to do it is through fire. Well, that's true. However, McGuire understood and he turned to him and he, he said, Buck, I think that was, was the name. He said, Buck, this isn't about protecting the yellow belly pond. This is about putting the ecosystem back into sync. This is about using wilderness as an untrammeled natural phenomenon 
so that we can learn from it. Bingo, the guy got it. And, and that was the first articulation that I ever heard inside the Forest Service of the proper role of fire and wilderness was to have the natural system function naturally. West Fork, this is Bad Luck Lookout, over. And then we had the fire, I think we called it the Bad Luck Fire. I have a fire to report at 179 degrees, one zero minutes. It is just a half mile below my lookout. That was a defining moment too. Now, I, I had, I'd had fire as a responsibility when I was a staff man. And so I'd done a fair amount of suppression. So I go out to see the fire. I, I actually took my kids out I was on a Sunday. We went out to the fire and I was carrying a, sh a fire shovel. And we were walking up the hill. And I had to fight myself to keep from using the shovel to turn the log around so it wouldn't roll down the hill or to dig a little spot so that the pine cone, because it was so natural that if you went to a fire, your reason to go there was to put it out. It was in, it was in me too. And, and by the middle of the afternoon though, and uh, I was able to, to watch it roll down the hill and burn and come back up with pine cones would roll down. You'd hit a bit of fuel, come back up the hill. I'm like, wow, this is not a fire I've ever seen. Because I always went into a fire with the concept of Where's, where's its weak point? How can I put it out? And now I'm watching it as a process. That was a defining afternoon. Just to go out there and be an observer of fire, not a suppressor. By that time in the Forest Service, I don't think there were really very many observers of fire. Everybody that was in the fire game was a specialist in suppression. And suddenly we're changing. This was not let burn, that's what everybody called it. It was a prescribed fire program, carefully uh, structured, proved by the Chief of the Forest Service, uh, and it worked. When we went in, you could see it didn't destroy the, the, the landscape. You could see how it enhanced the natural. As you get more and more fires on the landscape, you end up with kind of a self-limiting situation. You, you increase your comfort zone in managing future fires because you really are creating a mosaic of different time since burn patches, okay, a puzzle piece pattern out there, so that then when new fires start, there's some confidence that you have moderated the fire growth potential on these fires, and so it's easier to make decisions on these landscapes. Canyon Creek started in, in June, and, and the ranger approved it. And by being out there, you could stand on a ridge top, and you could see the fire pat burn patterns. You could see the mosaic on the ground, and it looked like it was multiple years of fires. And so we were of assumption that you would get some pretty good fire back there, but they basically wouldn't go very far. So I'm feeling pretty confident. We're, we're, we're telling everybody we got it under control. It's going to be fine. And um, I let's see, it was in August of, or late July, the first big run came, and that was 10,000 acres. And I was here in town. I was driving down the street over here someplace, and I saw a cumulus cloud up over there in the, on the horizon. And I looked around, and there weren't any other cumulus clouds anywhere. And I said, oh, boy, we finally got it to burn and it burned 10,000 acres, and it burned it in a, in a manner that um, 
It was a good mosaic. Burn a little, not burn a little, burn, 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 burn. And we flew it, it looked great. Well, it's best to make a long story short, I guess. It piddled around and kept doing those little burns all summer long. And we were expecting the weather change that usually occurs about the 20th of August in Missoula, Montana. It always rains fair week. Everybody said that. It didn't happen. And the fire just kept burned. And we weren't calling a suppression fire. We were trying to allow it to be a wilderness fire. And, uh, and we began to get nervous. And, and then it started, by that time, it started giving us trouble. Yellowstone's burning, we have no resources. We don't have helicopters, we don't have fire crews, we don't have anything, they're all down in Yellowstone on the 88 fire. And so, even if I wanted to put it out, I couldn't put it out. Even if we called it a suppression fire, we couldn't put it out. So we're living with it. By that time, we're up around 60,000, 70,000 acres, and it's pretty scary. There's fire all over. The fastest spread in coniferous forest that had, had ever been recorded on the North American continent. Well, the 88 fire really taught us a lesson of humility because we didn't ever think we'd have this fire. We really didn't. Um, and so we, we had reassured the public all year long, all summer long, that they were safe, and they weren't. We needed to be more humble about how we dealt with the public. It was an unpredictable event that, from my standpoint, did not change the commitment to fire management. By that time, and I had checked it out, we'd had a 350 fires in the wilderness under prescription by 88. None of them had caused a problem. We had a wilderness fire in 79, I put it out. Was that a mistake? Would we have been better off if we'd allowed it to burn 30,000 acres? If it had burned 30,000 acres, the fire of 88 would probably have not gone out of the wilderness on the south end. So I tell fire managers, putting one out could be a mistake too. In 1994, the Howling Fire started on June 23rd, which in the Northern Rockies is a fairly wet time. In fact, it started during a rainstorm. We sent some people in and, and sure enough, they found a little fire that had started. Very small, they could have stomped it out with their boots at the time and be done in five minutes. And we said, no, we that's in an area where we can allow fire to burn and let's uh, step back, it's raining right now, it probably won't continue through the night, and uh, we'll do some analysis and we'll see where we're at. We're at. And sure enough, the fire continued to burn. And we sent people in to do some monitoring. We had to tell them, hey, be careful where you're walking because you're gonna build a fire line around this fire. It really was not much bigger than a campfire. Nineteen ninety four had become a significant fire season. In fact, we had been getting a lot of questions of whether or not we really should continue managing the howling fire. And we were adamant that we needed to continue in managing this fire as a prescribed natural fire.
everything showed that the Howling Fire was in a place where the likelihood of it moving to where we didn't want, which was south, um, southeast towards Apgar and West Glacier, that that was extremely unlikely. Well, we got two other lightning starts in that MMA. So we had to decide what to do with those two fires because by policy, they had to be declared suppression fires. And what we decided we were going to do is to um, uh, contain those within the MMA of the Howling Fire. Brought up some interesting policy questions because one of the suppression fires burned together with the PNF. So, okay, now what do we have? And some people encouraged us to say, oh, well, now it's all suppression fire. So now you have to go put the howling fire out. And Tom Zimmerman, he was just terrific at looking at things and being able to work with policy. And he said, no, I don't think we need to do that. And so we started to draw a line of what constituted the um, other fires that need to be in a suppression mode and versus the howling fire. So it, it became a, a very significant fire for, for several reasons. The Howling Fire was significant for the park because it was the first fire of any real significance that they had managed as a PNF. Managed it while managing other fires that were much more active. And so being able to build some confidence with fire management in the park. As people started seeing the success and the need for this, uh, fairly quickly, the Forest Service said, hey, this is a really good thing. We are gonna have our, our people participate in the incident management teams, and we are going to have our own fire use modules. But the rest of the success was, the Howling Fire was allowed to burn till it's snowed on. And, and then the sequence to that was, now we had to look at policies. You saw a lot of people coming into the organization who'd come up being well-educated in academia, master's degree in ecology, master's degree in botany, wildlife biologists, all of a sudden playing a role in the leadership of organizations, both in the Forest Service, National Park Service, it shifted how the thinking came about regarding fire management at that time. National Fire Plan, we had a whole infusion of people and their whole scope was put fire out. And now we're almost a generation in fire management organization later, is we didn't put an infusion into the ecology side of the program or the resource management side of the program to 
basically offset where fire needed to be, what we did was it was all about putting fire out. We staffed engines, we staffed aviation resources. There wasn't the focus on putting fire on the landscape. use of fire across the landscape. In a way, it is a belief system that is strongly motivated, very strongly motivated. Um, you know what's good for the land, and you know this societal and the political and the agency back pressure against what you know is good for the land. And so maybe one of the reasons I could do it at that time is I was young enough not to know what to be afraid of. One of the things you learn is if you want to change the paradigm of an agency. Now that's what this was. This wasn't just something that you know just tap. It was changing the paradigm, totally changing it. A small group of dedicated people that do not give up and work together, and particularly if you can go across agency lines, that's how change happens. That's how Wilderness Fire Program was able to continue on. A lot of um, professional land managers in many disciplines, every discipline, but had fire experience and had knowledge and had qualifications so that when you had a need to get out and get a prescribed burn done, you could draw people in and, and you could fill in the number of people you needed. Well, we don't have that anymore. We don't know what the climate's going to do. We're going through a time period of uh, vast extremes from very dry to very wet and we don't know what that's all going to be. We're seeing more fire. That was the hindsight from 88 is you got to think a lot bigger and you got to think longer duration. Fire is a little bit more challenging to manage. We have a lot of managers that may have not come up with the same focus on how fire plays its role in this ecological condition and that challenges us but those areas where it's easy to manage for land management objectives where fire can play its role, those areas have been burned over the last, we're going on almost 30 years now. They have tremendous mosaics in them. And so those fires aren't getting as big anymore and they're being managed by natural boundaries. The agency has got to recognize that healthy, functioning ecosystems is our protection against climate change. And the way we do that in most of the Western states is through a good fire use program. We can keep these ecosystems healthy if we do it right.
thousands of years. People never deluded themselves that they could control fire. So they didn't try. They tried to work with it. Indigenous uses of fire was everywhere. That they were burning and they were very expert at it. Not only have we come in and been suppressing fires for more than a century, but we've also removed uh, the addition of fires from the indigenous people. Those, what we're doing is we're actually making these ecosystems more sensitive to climate change. We're making the worst fires worse. We're saving all the biomass that accumulates that normally would be depleted through repeating burns. We are saving that biomass for the worst case where we already know we're going to lose. So, you know, the conclusion from all of the research and my personal experience is that fire is an ally. It's the only way out of the situation. I mean, literally, fire is the solution. It's the problem, but it's also the solution. It's the only solution. No. Mm -hmm. 